Hi everybody and welcome back to OMN Insights. My name is Sariti Kadir and I'm your host and today we're going to continue our conversation about the peace negotiations between the Oromo Liberation Army and Ethiopian government and also have a conversation about the political conditions and violence faced by the Wallo people. But before we get into that and before I introduce our guest, we have a short announcement to play. Sagale Bridge Reality, Gare Samuel Brahan. Mani Jirenya, Elena Maf Niber Bachisa. In Nikunigaru, Jirenya Tun Buhore Yadana Maboko Chisa, God dis Argal Fit E Jurachuf Namasachis. Mare is in his canakanabita to you fit and Akasmas, Kanufikabden, Gurgutanibu Akabesata Un, Garet Kat, Yukanga Gudat Jira to you were bad. Dafa Marisa, Breach Reality. Torbil Bila Kenya, Torba, Jaa, Sadi, Torba, Afur Afur, Sadet, Sadi, Jaa, Lamaratnus Bilbila, Breach Reality. Gary Samuel Berhanu. Today, we have the pleasure of being joined by activist Aisha Oromia Ali uh, to have our conversation about uh, the recent negotiations between the Oromo Liberation Army and the government, and to also talk about uh, the conditions faced by the Wadlo people. Thank you so much for joining us today, Aisha. Thank you for having us. Uh, sorry, thank you, Aisha. Uh, so Asia, we have reached quite a historic juncture in the Oromo liberation struggle with the only political events resembling the recently beginning uh, negotiations and also recently concluding negotiations in Tanzania uh, being the 1991 negotiations and closely followed by the negotiations of 2018. Regarding the talks, the Oromo Liberation Army stated uh, in a press release that although some understanding was reached on outstanding issues, there was no agreement reached on key political matters in this round of talks. The organization iterated a commitment to continue pursuing the peaceful resolution of the conflict and that both parties acknowledged the need to continue the talks to permanently and peacefully end uh, this war. There hasn't been any information released uh, through official channels about the political matters discussed, the points of difference or the areas where understanding was reached. Uh, in your view, Aisha, what do you think both parties should be prioritizing uh, as what sounds like future talks uh, are organized? Uh, thank you, uh, Sorati, for starting uh, off with uh, uh, that introduction. Uh, I think what we need to understand um, as the Oromo nation and um, just the world in general needs to understand that the Oromo Liberation Army has taken up arms and is defending the Oromo rights, the Oromo interests. I think that's first and foremost what's important and what we need to acknowledge. Um, the reason why since 2018, the most recent negotiations and um, you know, the change in, in, in government, that all uh, came about because of the uh, Oromo student movement, uh, the Oromo protests, which brought about that change. And the Oromo protests and the students who participated in those protests, their main objectives was the Oromo concerns. The Oromo concerns need to be addressed. It wasn't just about putting um, Abby or somebody who speaks Afan Oromo in power. It was about a systemic change because Oromos have been marginalized and oppressed for such a long time. Um, that's why that revolution happened. And um, unfortunately, although there was some sort of uh, change for a temporary amount of time, it seemed to be that the Oromo concerns were not addressed and therefore the Oromo Liberation Army uh, continued that revolution and uh, took up arms to defend the Oromo rights. So I think first, that's what's important. We need to acknowledge that. And then, you know, we can't really, we don't know, well, in general, we can kind of guess what um, the key Oromo uh, political matters are that were trying to be discussed um, during those negotiations. However, we don't know what the um, exact points of discussion were so it's kind of hard to uh, pinpoint but just in general I think um, as, as, as an Oromo person I would say that it's important that both parties um, hold the Oromo interest um, uh, as a priority. I know that Oromo Liberation Army does that because that's why they are where they are today and that's why um, the negotiations happened and these first round of peace talks 
actually happened, it's because of the Oromo Liberation Army. Um, but I am not sure about the current government and the people who are in power, uh, because I have a big question, uh, Mark, because I, I am one of, I'm a pretty big critic when it comes to the current government because of their um, continued systemic oppression of the Oromo people and other oppressed, oppressed nations. So I think um, the, the current government really needs to look into the demands and uh, the interests that the Oromo Liberation Army are presenting to them, and they need to meet in the middle. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you say Oromo interests, um, Asia, can we be a little specific? What are we talking about? Are we talking about administration of certain cities? Are we talking about um, cultural socio, uh, socio-political rights and freedoms? If, if you were on that table, what would you not leave uh, without ensuring was talked about? <laughs> That's a pretty good question. Um, so, you know, I'm just like a community member, like somebody who advocates for the Oromo rights. Um, but I think uh, this question should be more directed to um, Oromo leaders who are actually a part of uh, this negotiation. But if it was up to me um, at uh, Asia, I know I say Oromo interests in general. Um, you know, in the Oromo camp, there's always like these two main ideologies that kind of like um, clash. And one is, you know, the right to self determination, which includes like Oromos having their democratic rights respected um, under the current Republic of Ethiopia. Um, and then there's the other side where they say, uh, where the argument is, no, we need an independent Oromia and we need Oromia to stand on its own. And that's the only way that Oromos are going to be respected and um, uh, their concerns are going to be addressed in the Horn of Africa. So it's these two that, um, that kind of like clash um, and a lot of the Oromo uh, leaders um, over the years have had uh, to go back and forth in between these two ideologies. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what is important when we say Oromo interests is in general, Oromos need to be respected, Oromos need to be acknowledged, Oromos need to, um, just in all areas that you're saying, socio-political, political, administrative, economic, you know, cultural, historical, all that needs to be acknowledged for Oromos. And I think the only people that can do that are Oromos themselves. So it's very important that we fight for our rights and we maintain and acknowledge our rights. Um, and then that way, others will be able to, to uh, respect us. And the issue is with the current Ethiopian government and the previous Ethiopian governments, have, they've always um, upheld that um, hege hegemonic uh, Habasha supremacy uh, system. And that's why Oromos have always been rejected because Oromos and Ethiopi the Ethiopian system they just don't mesh, they don't uh, go together. And that's why you've always got revolts here and there over the years, you know? And, you know, like from the 50s to the 60s, you know, the Afran Kallo revolution, the Majatulam um, Association, uh, the Bale revolt, you know, all this led to the birth of the Oromo Liberation Front and uh, they birthed the Oromo Liberation Army, Wobble. So, you know, all this contributed to Oromo consciousness, waking up, you know. Oromos have lost their identity for years. Um, and just the way that Menelik and um, the, the governments after that continued that supremacy has affected Oromos. And I think when I say interests and rights, it's about getting all that back because a type of oppression may be different, but it's always that Habasha, uh, dominant system that has oppressed the Oromos and um, Oromo rights and interests are getting back what's 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 theirs. Hi. Uh, so thank you, Aisha, for that response. Before we move on uh, from discussing these uh, negotiations to our topic of the political violence faced by the Wallo people, I want to ask you this. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation uh, on this on this show with Shavoy Busman Nioni, who is the executive director of the African Leadership Center. And I had asked her about the role that women play in peace negotiations and whether 
we miss out on something consequential and irreplaceable when women are not at these tables. And, um, you know, I noted that on both sides, both on the OLA side and on the Ethiopian government side, there were no women part of this round of negotiations. And I absolutely don't know if that if uh, uh, that is intended to be changed in the future. But I want to know from you, Aisha, as a woman in this struggle, uh, as an activist, how important is it uh, for uh, this moment that women are heard at that table and generally in this discourse? Yes, that's a very good point that you raised, Sorati. Um, I noticed that as well. I was a little disappointed um, not to see any females at that table because, you know, historically um, with the Oromo struggle, um, we we lack uh, le women leadership uh, from the women's side. Um, you know, I don't know if like there's uh, many factors that contribute to that from both women and from men. Uh, but I think it's very important that women are at the table because women women bring a different perspective, and they have different approaches to um, uh, negotiating and even leadership. So I think it's very important that women are present at hopefully at the next round of um, peace talks. Um, that's my hope and. As Oromos, uh, you're, you know of the Sinke institution. Uh, the Sinke institution is an equal system up to the Gadar system. Um, and then in some places are, is actually considered higher than the Gadar system. Um, you know, if there is any warring tribes or, you know, uh, men that are in fights or battles, um, if a woman comes in with her Sinke, um, they immediately have to stop out of respect and immediately have to reconcile. So, you know, um, in general, the Oromo society holds women to a high uh, standard mm -hmm. um, and they have a high place in the uh, society for women. But over the years, due to uh, colonization and oppression, Oromos have tend to lose that culture, that rich culture. Um, and, um, you know, again, the point that we discussed earlier, where Oromo interests and Oromo rights need to be um, addressed. It's about bringing back this rich, deep culture um, of the Sinke institution and the Gadar system and just stuff that we have lost over over the years. We need to bring that back. And then I mm -hmm. think that way um, women will become more visible in our society and will be at important um, talks because um, you have to be at the decision making table. And I think women need to to be there. Thank you for that, um, Aisha. Uh, so moving on to the second part of our conversation and uh, moving towards the end of our conversation as well. Over the last year, uh, and as most recently documented, which was as early as January this year, uh, we've seen a number of organized attacks against Oromo people living in Wello, an Oromia, what's called a special zone, located in the Amhara region of Ethiopia. The Oromo Liberation Army released a press statement on the 27th of January this year stating that an attack by Amhara Special Forces, quote here, left over 68 Oromo civilians killed and 52 wounded in the same district. Uh, the violence against Wallo Oromos remains unabated to this day and the actual uh, casualty figures are very likely to rise. And quote, the Oromo Leadership uh, Legacy Advocacy Association also uh, released a statement on these particular attacks uh, uh, recounting uh, similar figures uh, and similar violence. The question here is what should parties trying to understand uh, the causes of violence against people, or Oromo people in Wallo, know about the political reality and perhaps even historical reality, because you've touched on that quite a bit in your, in your previous responses, uh, fueling this violence? How should people be uh, striving to look at this to really understand the situation accurately? Yes, um, thank you, Sorati. So when it comes to the situation of the Oromos in Wallo, um, it's a unique it's it's a unique situation to uh, the rest of Oromia. However, it they're all interlinked. So it goes it comes down to that systemic Habasha system that have dominant Habasha system that I was talking about earlier. It's that Amhara hegemony and supremacy that continues to fuel this violence. Um, there's nothing else or more to say. So when it comes to historically, I know the current um, OPDO map of the Oromia region actually cuts uh, Wallo off and Wallo is located in northern Oromia. But the uh, Oromia map that the Oromo people use, um, uh, Wallo is um, at the top and 
uh, I think we all are familiar with that. So number one, I think that's what's, in, uh, what's important to mention. Um, you know, historically, the creation of OPD, the Oromo People Democratic Organization, um, they, they were never uh, created to um, uphold the interests of the Oromo people. And that's, that's why that top part of Oromia, Northern Oromia was actually chopped off basically. And once it was chopped off, what happened was the Oromos living in Wallo were like, no, we are part of the Oromia region and we need to be acknowledged and we need to be identified. So that's why that special zone name was given, that special Oromia zone um, for the, the, the Oromos in Wallo was given because they actually fought for those, uh, mm -hmm. for that recognition. But they're still in administratively under the Amhara region, which puts them in, in more danger than the rest of uh, the Oromos who live in Oromia. And they're also engulfed. So in the west, uh, they're bordered by the Amhara region, in the, in the north by uh, the Tigray region, and then on the east, the Afar region. And then technically in the south, they're supposed to be connected to Oromia, but what they did was there's, a, there's a, an area where they actually uh, settled Amharas to separate the special Oromia zone and um, Oromia. So that's why they named it the special Oromia zone. So that's just a little bit of a background. Um, but in general, the reason why it's fueled and the Oromos in Wallu are very, um, very brave, courageous in nature um, and very proud Oromos who have upheld their uh, uh, culture, their language, um, and the religion that they follow, which is Islam. So all these are very important factors to their identity. And all these factors are things that um, the Amhara regional government and, and, and the Amhara Fano extremists don't like. So they use this to come and attack these innocent civilians. And they have, they have nothing to do but to defend themselves. Not one day did they ever cross the border and attack anybody. Mm -hmm. It's always they, the Amhara, the Amhara regional government or the militia or the Fano extremists, whoever it is from that um, governing body that comes, crosses the border, starts attacking innocent farmers, innocent women, innocent children, um, and they keep dying on the daily. And it's really, really sad and disappointing. Um, the, we know that the government has, you know, perpetuated violence across Oromia. So it's no different um, in, in the Oromia special zone of Wallo. However, what makes it unique is the fact that they are encircled by different regions and th there isn't really like any support or any help from other Oromos that can um, quickly reach them because they are in that circle. Uh, and by the time the Oromos cross the border from Oromia to come reach them, it's kind of too late. So that's what makes it unique to the rest of Oromia, but there's violence across Oromia, internally displaced people across Oromia. So, you know, the humanitarian crisis across Oromia, including Wollo, is just really devastating and um, really sad. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that insight, uh, Aisha. I think the conversation uh, about the, the social, political situation and violence that people face uh, in Wallo is one that should be had uh, continuously. So I appreciate you helping us better understand uh, that context. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us today at All Men Insights. And uh, yeah, I look forward to speaking with you again, hopefully in the future. Thank you so much, Sarati, for having me on now, All Women Insights. All right, everybody, uh, we will be back together next week uh, for a continuation uh, of this discussion regarding the peace negotiations between the Ormo Liberation Army uh, and the Ethiopian government. I hope that you found this conversation uh, insightful and fruitful. My name is Sori Tikadia. You're watching Ormen Insights, and I'll see you soon.